Well, hello again. It's wonderful to see you today. And I'm so glad that you've come back to decorate, sing, and share another story. Sasha sends her greetings, but I'm afraid that she's sleeping in bed. (laughs) Well, you know you've come just in time to find out what is in our Advent calendar for today, December 23rd. It's almost the last ornament. It's the next to last one. Are you ready to see? Oh, it's a little Christmas present. I guess I'll have to wait until Christmas to find out what's inside. Sounds interesting. (laughs) Well, why don't we find a nice place for our package on the Christmas tree? How about here? I'm sure many of us are looking forward to giving and receiving gifts this year. And you know, generosity really is one of the most important things about Christmas time. Well, that makes me think of a Christmas song that I've always really liked. And maybe it's because it talks about a good king who is very generous and kind to his people. And I wonder if you know the song and the story I'm talking about. There are several verses of it, but part of it goes like this. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen, when the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even. Brightly shone the moon that night, though the frost was cruel, when a poor man came in sight, gathering winter fuel. Bring me flesh and bring me wine, bring me pine logs hither. Thou and I will see him dine when we bear them thither. Therefore, Christian men, be sure, wealth or rank possessing, ye who now will bless the poor, shall yourselves find blessing. Well, the song tells the story of Wenceslas on St. Stephen's feast day, which is the day after Christmas. It was a very cold and snowy day, and he noticed a poor man outside looking for some wood to make a fire. Wenceslas asked a servant about the man, and even, even though the weather was very cold and fierce, Wenceslas himself, along with a servant, set out to carry food, drink, and pine logs for a fire to the poor man's home. And the song ends by encouraging all of us to be as kind and generous as Wenceslas. The story that this song is based on was written by a Czech poet in 1847, but it's based on the life of a real person who lived in the early 10th century. That's more than a thousand years ago. Wenceslas was the Duke of Bohemia, which is now the Czech Republic. But after his death, he was named a king and a saint. People wrote about his kind actions for many years, especially his giving gifts to the poor and to people in prison. And that was very unusual during that time. And You know, many years ago, there weren't as many charities and government organizations that could help people. There were some things that were given through the church, and of course, individuals might have given to people in need, but the government was very different back then. And so to have a ruler who would help people in need was very special. Well, why don't we practice wishing someone a Merry Christmas in Czech? And in Czech, you would say, Vesele Vánoce. Let's try that together. Vesele, vesele, vanoce, vanoce, vesele, vanoce, vesele, vanoce. Very nice. Though King Wenceslas was known for giving gifts, he's not the one who brings gifts to children in the Czech Republic. Actually, at Christmas time, the Czech tradition is that children receive their gifts from the little Jesus or baby Jesus, which is very similar to the Christkind in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. 
Well, the biggest celebration in the Czech Republic happens on Christmas Eve, and that's when little Jesus delivers his presents. He brings them during dinner, and the dinner is a special meal that includes traditional foods like fried carp, which is a kind of fish, and potato salad. Well, when a bell rings after dinner, Czech children know that they'll find their presents under the tree. (laughs) Traditionally, after opening presents, people would sing Christmas carols. And I think that sounds like a really good idea right now. (laughs) So why don't we sing two of the songs we've practiced together? We'll start with The Holly and the Ivy, and then we will sing Jingle Bells. So as a reminder, the lyrics for The Holly and the Ivy are The holly and the ivy, when they are both full grown Of all the trees that are in the wood, the holly bears the crown Oh, the rising of the sun and the running of the deer The playing of the merry organ, sweet singing in the choir Well, would you like to sing that with me now? We'll just sing it one time together Okay Hmm The holly and the ivy, when they are both full grown, of all the trees that are in the wood, the holly bears the crown. Oh, the rising of the sun and the running of the deer, the playing of the merry organ, sweet singing in the choir. Very nice. And now how about jingle bells? We'll start with dashing through the snow. Ready? Dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh. O'er the fields we go, laughing all the way. Ha, 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 bells on bobtail ring, making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing a sleighing song tonight. Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. (laughs) That was great. It's always fun singing with you, and I look forward to more singing tomorrow. But right now, it's time for our story of the day. And we're continuing the story we began yesterday, which was called Old Father Christmas, written by J.H. Ewing. And if you miss the beginning, I'd recommend watching the video because we talked about a lot of different things in it. But here's a little recap. So this story is a man remembering a childhood Christmas, the Christmas when he was eight. And this took place in 1830. And that was a time when most people did not have Christmas trees in their homes. And these children, it's um, a boy and his sister whose name is Patty, And they had never before seen a Christmas tree. And they'd seen a picture that year in a book of Old Father Christmas with a Christmas tree. And they were very excited about that. And then they were outside playing on Christmas Eve. And they happened to meet a man who looked just like the picture of Old Father Christmas they had seen in that book. And he was even carrying a tree. Well, it turns out that this man, it was a case of mistaken identity, but because this man was hard of hearing, he, he ta- kind of didn't realize that the children were asking him whether he was Father Christmas. And so he said, yes. <laughs> and he told them that he was going to come back at four o'clock. And they thought that that meant he was going to bring them their very first Christmas tree and presents. And so the children have been anxiously waiting to find out whether or not that's what's going to happen. And they were waiting for the clock and it had just rung. It had just struck. So they heard the clock. One, two, three, four. And they ran back outside to see if Father Christmas was there. We ran to our old place and peeped, but could see nothing. We'd better get up on the wall, I said. And with some difficulty and distress from rubbing her bare knees against the cold stone, 
and getting the snow up her sleeves, Patty got on to the little wall. I was just struggling after her when something warm and something cold coming suddenly against the bare calves of my legs made me shriek with fright. I came down with a run and bruised my knees, my elbows, and my chin, and the snow that hadn't gone up Patty's sleeves went down my neck. Then I found that the cold thing was a dog's nose, and the warm thing was his tongue. And Patty cried from her post of observation, It's Father Christmas's dog, and he's licking your legs! It really was the dirty little brown and white spaniel, and he persisted in licking me and jumping on me and making curious little noises that must have meant something if only one had known his language. I was rather upset at the moment. My legs were sore. I was a little afraid of the dog, and Patty was very much afraid of sitting on the wall without me. You won't fall, I said to her. Get down, will you? I said to the dog. Humpty Dumpty fell off a wall, said Patty. Oh, whoa, said the dog. I pulled Patty down, and the dog tried to pull me down. But when my little sister was on her feet, to my relief, he transferred his attentions to her. When he had jumped at her and licked her several times, he turned around and ran away. He's gone, I said. Oh, I'm so glad. But even as I spoke, he was back again, crouching at Patty's feet and glaring at her with eyes the color of his ears. Now, Patty was very fond of animals. And when the dog looked at her, she looked at the dog and then said to me, He wants us to go with him. On which, as if he understood our language, though we were ignorant of his, The spaniel sprang away and went off as hard as he could, and Patty and I were after him, a dim hope crossing my mind. Perhaps Father Christmas has sent him for us. The idea was rather favored by the fact that he led us up the lane, only a little way. Then he stopped by something lying in the ditch, and once more we cried in the same breath, "'It's old Father Christmas!' Returning from the hall, the old man had slipped upon a bit of ice and lay stunned in the snow. Patty began to cry. I think he's dead, she sobbed. He is so very old, I don't wonder, I murmured, but perhaps he's not. I'll fetch father. My father and Kitty were soon on the spot. Kitty was as strong as a man, and they carried Father Christmas between them to the kitchen. There he quickly revived. I must do Kitty the justice to say that she did not utter a word of complaint at the disturbance of her labors. Kitty is the the cook, and she was very busy cooking a lot of special foods for Christmas. And she drew the old man's chair close up to the oven with her own hand. She was so much affected by the behavior of his dog that she admitted him even to the hearth, on which Puss, being acute enough to see how matters stood, lay down with her back so close to the spaniels that Kitty could not expel one without expelling both. For our parts, we felt sadly anxious about the tree. Otherwise, we could have wished no better treat than to sit at Kitty's round table taking tea with Father Christmas. Our usual fare of thick bread and treacle was tonight exchanged for a delicious variety of cakes, which were none the worse to us for being tasters and wasters, that is, little bits of dough or shortbread put in to try the state of the oven, so to test it, and certain cakes that had gotten broken or burnt in the baking. Well, there we sat, helping old Father Christmas to tea and cake, and wondering in our hearts What could have become of the tree? Patty and I felt a delicacy in asking Old Father Christmas about the tree. It was not until we had had tea three times round with tasters and wasters to match that Patty said very gently, It's quite dark now. And then she heaved a deep sigh. Burning anxiety came over me. I leaned toward Father Christmas and shouted, I had found out that it was needful to shout. I suppose the candles are on the tree now. 
just about putting of them on, said Father Christmas. And the presents, too, said Patty. Aye, aye, to be sure, said Father Christmas. And he smiled delightfully. I was thinking what further questions I might ask when he pushed his cup toward Patty, saying, Since you are so pressing, miss, I'll take another dish. And Kitty, swooping on us from the oven, cried, Make yourself at home, sir. There's more where these came from. Make a long arm, Miss Patty, and hand him the cakes. So we had to devote ourselves to the duties of the table. And Patty, holding the lid with one hand and pouring with the other, supplied Father Christmas's once with a heavy heart. At last he was satisfied. I said grace, during which he stood, and indeed he stood for some time afterward with his eyes shut. I fancy, under the impression that I was still speaking, <laughs> he had just said a fervent amen and reseated himself when my father put his head into the kitchen and made this remarkable statement. Old Father Christmas has sent a tree to the young people. Patty and I uttered a cry of delight, and we forthwith danced round the old and saying, How nice! Oh, how kind of you! Which I think must have bewildered him, but he only smiled and nodded. Come along, said my father. Come, children. Come, Reuben. Come, Kitty. And he went into the parlor, and we all followed him. My godmother's picture of a Christmas tree was very pretty, and the flames of the candles were so naturally done in red and yellow that I always wondered that they did not shine at night. But the picture was nothing to the reality. We had been sitting almost in the dark, for Kitty said firelight was quite enough to burn at mealtimes. And when the parlor door was thrown open, and the tree with lighted tapers on all the branches burst upon our view, the blaze was dazzling and threw such a glory round the little gifts and the bags of colored muslin with acid drops and pink rose drops and comfits inside, those are candies, as I shall never forget. We all got something, and Patty and I, at any rate, believed that the things came from the stores of Old Father Christmas. We were not undeceived, even by his gratefully accepting a bundle of old clothes, which had been hastily put together to form his present. We were all very happy, even Kitty, I think, though she kept her sleeves rolled up and seemed rather to grudge enjoying herself, a weak point in some energetic characters. She went back to her oven before the lights were out and the angel on the top of the tree was taken down. She locked up her present a little workbox, at once. She often showed it off afterward, but it was kept in the same bit of tissue paper till she died. Our presence certainly did not last so long. The old man died about a week afterward, so we never made his acquaintance as a common personage. When he was buried, his little dog came to us. I suppose he remembered the hospitality he had received. Patty adopted him, and he was very faithful. Puss always looked on him with favor. I hoped during our rambles together in the following summer that he would lead us at last to the cave where the Christmas trees are dressed. But he never did. Our parents often spoke of his late master as Old Reuben, but children are not easily disabused of a favorite fancy. And in Patty's thoughts and in mine, that old man was long gratefully remembered as Old Father Christmas. Why don't we end our time together today with another Christmas carol? And this one is called Ding Dong Merrily on High. And if you know it, why don't you sing with me? Ding dong merrily on high, in heaven the bells are ringing. Ding 
ding-dong, verily the sky is riven with angels singing Gloria, Hosanna in excelsis. Well, thank you again for coming back today. I hope you had a good time singing, reading, and decorating. And I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye.